We're going to go live. Can you all just talk in? Yeah, you guys can talk. Just talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, right. Talk yeah. amongst yourselves. What's up? What's up? Should I put the countdown on? Nope. Not a whole lot. Of, Sarah, what are you yeah. drinking tonight? <sighs> Tears and dreams. Okay, Miss Shakespeare, that's great. What coffee are you drinking? <laughs> it is called Mallorca something. Um, it's organic. It's dark roast. It's in a giant yellow bag at uh, Costco and it's delicious and it's fancy it's so fa uh oh oh hi you left my screen oh I didn't do that what just disappear I try to say some of that for the actual show but Oh, so he is a Tennessee it. fellow, currently a professor of theater, and he's no, Tennessee okay. State. Hey, hey he uh, I think. Oh wait. We're not gonna have that conversation. Now. Okay. Yeah. What do we want to talk about? Is it people that will join? Right. Today? Right. I understand. Okay. Jill says Jill to be quiet, and, and one second. Joel Pat is in the waiting room. Okay. Thank you. So just letting you know that he is here. Sorry. We're, and. Keep talking. Oh, she wants us to keep talking. She wants us to keep talking, but okay. also not talk. <laughs> duly, duly noted. Go ahead and mute them. It can be very healing, just viewing yeah. a painting and what you take from that. And, you know, it's, it reaches you on a soul level. When you wear a cape, it's a super passion. It's we are rolling. Hey, welcome to Coffee and Words. Um, I'm Sarah. I said, um, all right. This is so hard. I'm Sarah Jenkins. I'm the host. I don't like that, so I'm going to start again. My name is Sarah, and I host this show called Coffee and Words. And sometimes... Dang it! That was good. Dang it! Okay. And this was my dream. <laughs> and my dream is to get through this intro. <laughs> Somebody put something good in this mug. Okay. Welcome to Coffee and Words. My name is Sarah Jenkins. I'm an author, theater director, acting coach, and I host this show that does what? The I have show no idea. that you created for work with friends. That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> okay. One more. I'm, yeah, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm the host of Coffee and Words, and this is totally uncomfortable right now but I'm doing a channel intro because I want you to know what this channel is about and what you're gonna get is some awesome conversations because I have been truly inspired by the guests on my show. They come from all walks of life and all different avenues and at all different levels of success. I have been so blessed to sit down and have conversations with some really amazing people who have inspired me and, and taught me so much about life um, and about dreams and success and about the hardships in life and how to overcome things and I want to share that with you and that's what this show and this channel is all about it's about exploring um, our insecurities looking at what we really want out of life 
and how we can help people, how we can build community, how we can inspire each other, support each other, and uh, just to live the best life that we can. I think that we all have a dream. We all have something that we want. We all have something that we've envisioned. Um, sometimes it's hard to take the steps to get there, and sometimes we feel alone. And so what I want to do with Coffee and Words is to build a community that supports each other. And what I have found is that we're all learning together and that together we can make the world a better place, a more positive place to be, and we can put something positive out there. So I thank you for coming along on this journey. How do you want me to end it? Give me something. Uh, let's just stop. Okay. See, I had something going and I have no idea now. It was now. fantastic. But yeah, it's awesome. <sighs> <laughs> it's still hard, okay. Um, we're going into season three and I am so excited. I have a whole team working with me and it's, it's, so, it's so neat to see the show grow and to see where it's come from. We're gonna be doing live episodes. You can join in the conversation and you never know what you're gonna get. You're gonna hate me. Yes, maybe. Don't ever do a whole thing again. Okay, I will, I will, I'll do it, okay. Life and every choice that we make is just learning from the past experience of what we've tried and just moving ahead. No one has the right path. No one has all of the answers. Um, we just, we keep trying things until they are successful. And that is um, an annoying, but truthful part of the journey. And I've, I've had things along the way, which I've definitely, well, I say quote failed at, but I don't really consider them failures. Um, but things that didn't go the way that I planned and I'm, I'm all the better for them. And in the long run, those have actually come back to help me in, in various different ways. For me to fail is not to try. It's as simple as that. Like if you've tried and if you've given something everything, and I think even particularly with my fiction, like I, I write for me and I give my book everything. I put it out into the world. It does whatever it does. Like if it's well received, great. If it's not, then that's, you know, it is what it is. But as long as I know that I've tried everything and done everything that I can with that book, then I'm happy. Like, what else could I have asked for myself? I can't, I physically can't do anymore because I did everything. And there's some kind of comfort and peace in that. If there's one true thing that I've learned, it's small steps. And all you have to do is try to be a little bit better than you were yesterday. So if, you know, you know that you ate rubbish yesterday, just add something into your meal plan for that day that's a bit healthier. If you didn't drink enough water, drink an extra cup of water. Like true change doesn't happen fast and it doesn't happen easy. So a lot of, becoming productive is just building slow sustainable habits and looking at one thing at a time to change in your life to then over the long term then get those big results And art shines a bright light in very dark places. Art is powerful and we, we need people to use their creative talents. And yes. there's no talent too small. There's no form of creative energy that's too small or insignificant. And it's very easy to say, oh, well, I painted this, but it's not as good as that painting. And it's so easy to downplay our art um, and our creativeness, but it's all beautiful. And it's all necessary. When we combine all of those things, they come together and make this very beautiful thing that has the power, I believe, to change the world. Sometimes coffee and words is actually water and words, which is really boring. <laughs> is it though? <laughs> because I can't record at home currently. So I actually mm. have coffee today. So this is legit Chino well, up in here. Oh yes. Well, I went I went ahead and just bought the largest mug. Yes. Yes. 
I could possibly find because number one, I live in the desert and we need water. And yes, this is in fact water. Okay. hundred percent water baptized. You could probably right. sit in here and get baptized. <laughs> I mean, you know, and in a pinch, if you're in the middle of nowhere and it's a question, there's just only questionable areas to pee. You've got, you know, your own little porta potty right there. I mean, you know, cause hashtag van life. Yep. Yep. I got you. It can be very healing, just viewing yeah. a painting and what you take from that. And, you know, it's, it reaches you on a soul level. We are rolling. Hey, welcome to Coffee and Words. Um, I'm Sarah. I said, um, all right. This is so hard. I'm Sarah Jenkins. I'm the host. I don't like that. So I'm going to start again. My name is Sarah and I host this show called Coffee and Words. And sometimes, dang it! That was good. Dang it! Okay. And this was my dream. <laughs> and my dream is to get through this intro. <laughs> Somebody put something good in this mug. Okay. Welcome to Coffee and Words. My name is Sarah Jenkins. I'm an author, theater director, acting coach, and I host this show that does what? The I have no idea. That you created for what purpose? That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> okay. One more. Um, yeah, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm the host of Coffee and Words. And this is totally uncomfortable right now. But I'm doing a channel intro because I want you to know what this channel is about. And what you're going to get is some awesome conversations because I have been truly inspired by the guests on my show. They come from all walks of life in all different avenues and at all different levels of success. I have been so blessed to sit down and have conversations with some really amazing people who have inspired me and, and taught me so much about life um, and about dreams and success and about the hardships in life and how to overcome things. And I wanna share that with you. And that's what this show and this channel is all about. It's about exploring um, our insecurities looking at what we really want out of life and how we can help people, how we can build community, how we can inspire each other, support each other, and uh, just to live the best life that we can. I think that we all have a dream. We all have something that we want. We all have something that we've envisioned. Um, sometimes it's hard to take the steps to get there. And sometimes we feel alone. And so what I wanna do with Coffee and Words is to build a community that supports each other, and what I have found is that we're all learning together and that together we can make the world a better place, a more positive place to be, and we can put something positive out there. So I thank you for coming along on this journey. How do you want me to end it? Give me something. Uh, let's just stop. Okay. See, I had something going and I have no idea it was now. fantastic. But yeah, it's awesome. <sighs> it's still hard. Okay. We're going into season three and I am so excited. I have a whole team working with me and it's, it's, so, it's so neat to see the show grow and to see where it's come from. We're gonna be doing live episodes. You can join in the conversation and you never know what you're gonna get. You're gonna hate me. Yes. Go ahead, we're doing more things now. Okay, I will, I will, I'll do it, okay. So why is the show called Coffee and Words? Like, is, is it a sentimental thing or is it just like the first thing that popped in your head and it stuck? Yeah, it started like several years ago um, because you know my love affair with coffee and, mm -hmm. and reading and books and writing. And I did a post on Instagram years ago. Um, I don't even remember what it was, but um, I had coffee and I think I was reading. I was reading or writing something and I posted about it and I did a hashtag coffee and words because that's what popped in my head. It's like, oh, that sounds cool. I'm going to keep that in the back of my head. And I kind of kept some of those handles online. And then I did a YouTube channel that never had anything on it just to kind of hold that placeholder because I thought one day I want to do something with the, the name coffee and words because it just kind of summed me up, I think. So it was um, just a random Instagram post.
Nice. Yeah. And now it's become a now it's become a thing. It's a worldwide sensation. That's, really. Yeah. It's funny how that works. <laughs> my first interaction with you, I was still very, very much so young in my artistic journey as a creator. And you were trying something new or was was Players of Light your first um, theatrical directorial endeavor? And tell us a little bit more about that and like why you let an idiot like me and Micah and all the others in. <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to know? That's a big, that's, you know, I was a theater director for a number of years, um, started a troupe from the ground up, um, was not the first time I had been in directing, I had, that I had worked in theater. Um, I grew up in musical theater. Um, so, yeah. Any favorite roles? I love The Music Man. I didn't have a big part in that one and that's fine because it was so much fun and I still love to go back and watch that. It's just, I can still sing the songs. <laughs> oh, there's a recording of it. <laughs> oh, I don't you... know. I hope not. <laughs> but did you hope know so. that Hugh Jackman used to, uh, this is something I found so fascinating about him. He used to audition or one time auditioned uh, to the opening. I think it was like the opening scene uh, where they're on the train. Anyway, Hugh Jackman has wow. been in The Music Man and he's used it for audition pieces like in his early days. So I thought that was cool. I don't know. Now he gets to actually play it on Broadway. So if you want to pony up, y'all want to donate $1,200 to me and Sarah can go see it. That'd be phenomenal. Yes. Just saying. Just put We've that got, out there. You have Venmo, right? Yeah. Yeah, I got yeah, Venmo. Everybody Vin, in Venmo, Matt, and we're going to see Hugh Jackman. The music Man. Yeah. Not even music. Man. We're just going to see Hugh Jackman. Yeah, we're, we're going to see Hugh Jackman. Show up at his house. Hey, you too. But don't worry about it. He makes um, sourdough sorry. bread. He'd give us a loaf. He like goes and hands it out to people. Pro yeah, I'd also ask him for some coffee because he this also owns like a, a plug for Hugh Jackman's Instagram because that's where that he. Is, hey, that's the way I know you, all this stuff. <laughs> hey, Hugh, sponsor us. Thanks, buddy. Love you. And art shines a bright light in very dark places. Art is powerful and we, we need people to use their creative talents. And yes. there's no talent too small. There's no form of creative energy that's too small or insignificant. And it's very easy to say, oh, well, I painted this, but it's not as good as that painting. And it's so easy to downplay our art um, and our creativeness, but it's all beautiful. And it's all necessary. When we combine all of those things, they come together and make this very beautiful thing that has the power, I believe, to change the world. Welcome to the season three premiere of Coffee and Words. I've got my co-host, Matt Redding. And co my host. Co-host. And my amazing guest, my Rick McVeigh. <gasps> You're not Rick. No, I'm not. <laughs> Wait, we have an imposter. Someone stole Rick. What? What? So are you when you're done with Rick? <laughs> yes. Well, I spent five years teaching him at ETSU. I hope it's worked out all right. Okay, wait. Let me figure out who you are. Hang on. Okay. You look familiar. I think That's I may, good. you may have sold me a bra once. I did so. No, you know, wait, I sold Matt wait. a bra once. Wait. I still got it, by the way. I okay. got it. The bro. Yeah, uh, George Costanza's dad sold him a bra. That's that is what correct. It was. Wow. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Patrick Cronin, welcome to you? the show. Thank you. It's delightful. This is great. Oh, man. Well, I do want to tell everyone what happened to Rick. Uh, so Rick was yes. supposed to be here, and he will be back, and we'll have yes. him on the show. He had a schedule conflict last minute. So uh, he's not here, but wow, Patrick Cronin is here on Coffee and Words. That's great. So exciting. It's delightful. <laughs> and I got my mug Yes. my last tour right. of New York. Mine is uh, not near as uh, exciting. <laughs> well, Kiki Booth was a wonderful show, but yours is pretty. I like that. Yeah. I thought, yeah, I thought I'd go with all, <clears throat> you know, dainty and yeah, today. Yeah, that's but. good. And you, that's full. That's good. Mm. I used to Not take my long. kids to, to New York every year to see shows. The last, actually, the last time was, you know, pre-COVID. We saw Denzel Washington at Iceman Cometh, which was phenomenal. 
Wow. And, uh, and Kinky Boots might have been part of that. We went every year, and then we, uh, in the spring, went to L.A. So that wow. was also exciting, you know, for the kids. Well, you've had and an then, amazing career. I have. Um, you, it's, it's, you've been a yeah. professor, uh, so you've I mean, taught. Yeah, and uh, yeah. acting, and then you have uh, worked in theater and film and television. Yes. So, Matt, my do you first, recognize him? <laughs> my, my equity card was my first union card, which I got at uh, Memphis, Tennessee, at the Front Street Theater. Long gone, not my fault. And uh, I got my equity card for playing the devil in Damn Yankees in 1964. Wow. So that was my first union when I was 23 years old. And then I left there, went back to Philadelphia, which is my home. And then a year or two later, I joined AFTRA because I was doing a lot of voiceover work. And then in 1970, I joined Screen Actors Guild. Actually, my first union was in 1959 when I was playing bass in a band and um, I joined the American Federation of Musicians, Local 77. So I've been a union person all my life. And you've so, been acting for 78 years. Yes, I started, uh, that's a funny story. I started to tell your producer that today. Um, I always wanted to become famous enough to tell this story on, you know, Kimmel or, you know, Stephen Colbert. Well, never quite made it to that fame level. You don't need Kimmel. You got coffee and words I got right here. Matters. I got, <laughs> I got coffees and words, you know. <laughs> so um, I was three years old living in Philadelphia. And my father uh, was, well, a drunk is what he was, really. Uh, and he was gone a lot. So I was sitting in the living room. And you could always tell in the 1940s, an Irish living room from an Italian one. The Irish living rooms were covered in sheets, like everybody was dead. <laughs> Italian furniture was covered in plastic, which was worse than sheets, in my opinion, because you always ripped your legs when you sat on them. Anyway, we're covered in sheets, and I had a wind-up Victrola, and I was singing Red River Valley with Gene Autry. And my father, who was from Cork, a very thick rogue, and he said, Why? Now, I have no idea who this guy is. How the hell did he get into my house, this guy? He said, What are you doing, buddy? He said, I'm, I'm singing uh, pop. I thought it might be pop. He said, Well, if you're going to be singing, don't be singing that stuff. So he picked me up, and he carried me upstairs, and he put me on the toilet, which later I thought was significant. And then he taught me five songs, Danny Boy, The Rose of Trolley, The Boys from the County Court, McNamara's Band, and one other, I forget. Rose, I forget. Five of them, anyway. So having expended all this energy, he decided to see if he could make something out of it. So he carried me. There was a church and a bar in every corner in Philadelphia. And so I went in, he carried me into this bar, I'm three years old, he puts me on the bar because I can't walk. And he orders a shot in a beer, which was 35 cents, 1944. can remember like yesterday. And after he swigged that down, he said, all right, boy, start. Oh, the pale moon was rising above. I start singing. There's eight Irish that lined up against the bar and they all go, give him a drink. Oh my God, he's too young. Well, give his old man a trick. So I sang five songs. My father got five shots, five beers. And then we left and went to the next one. So um, most people are talking about like I was in the theater because I saw Larry over the age, Oedipus Rex. Um, I got into showbiz because I was like the young monkey on the orchid rider thing. I was the hustle for drinks, which I thought was more appropriate, finally. Wow. My aunt, my father's sister, did not approve. So her way of fixing it <clears throat> was to put me on the <clears throat> she horn and heart of shoulders out. So from 1944 to 1950, I sang songs on this show in Philadelphia. And uh, the rest sort of fell after that. But I thought that was a great yeah. start to show. I did have yeah. a, a moment in my 20s where... 
it was much more sanctified. And we could talk about that too. Well, before we get into talking about theater and some things, um, you were telling me this morning a little bit about um, your time on Seinfeld. And uh, I know you get that a lot, and that's like one of the iconic things. And I think that all of us at some point have had, it's, it's that show has been an integral part of our life in, in some way. It's affected us, you know, in some way. So what was that like uh, working on that show? You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Um, it was, I did 200 television shows and films in a 20 year, 23 year period. I started on Alice in 76 and I was a regular on Alice. And then I did the whole lexicon of, you know, Cheers, Night Court, did all of those. And then in the 90s, uh, I was blessed actually not only to do Seinfeld, but I became a regular on a home improvement, which I also like. And then I did Star Trek TNG. So at the end of my time in L.A., um, it, it was quite wonderful. Seinfeld was the highlight of my career. I mean, it was the audition itself. As comics, you'll appreciate this. I go in to read, and we're in one of those terrible rooms. You know, there's 40 comics. We really work. And people all who had specials on Comedy Central, these were not people on open mic events, these were names. And I thought, what am, what am I doing here exactly? And so they go in and there's this very small room with 40 people that should only fit 20. And uh, the rooms are torn apart. They're laughing, the laughs are enormous. And I'm thinking, um, uh, that's not what I'm seeing in this script. <laughs> So I go in, and this is the one where we hired George to sell bras, the <laughs> sniffing accountant. So he's, you know, and I have some poor young man or young woman reading with me who doesn't, can't read. So that's always fun. And he or she said, so your sell braziers are very interesting. And I go, yes, you know, you have a remarkable penchant for braziers. So we start this conversation. Now the room is silent. And in the room is Jerry Seinfeld, Larry David, and 40 writers. And all the other guys that come in, I was last, all the other guys that come in had torn the place up. And I thought, this isn't good. I'll, I'll be burning my SAG card in Westwood. <laughs> That's where this is going. <laughs> So I finish, and there's silence, and then Larry David said, that was very funny. <laughs> and then Jerry Seinfeld said, yes, Larry, very funny. And it dawned on me. What the other guys were doing was try to prove that they knew what the jokes were. <laughs> I played a guy who loved braziers. And I played a guy who was looking for a guy who loved braziers, not sexually, but saw that as a wonderful marketing tool. And that's not funny. It's not funny to Sid Farkas. No. He doesn't see anything funny about this. But the other guys were finding the jokes. And what the people were laughing at was their own material. But on the other hand, I showed them that this guy was real. And if Seinfeld was anything, as crazy as it got, at its core, it was always absolutely truthful. And that's true of comedy. You, you can't, if you bring stuff onto comedy, then you're not on Comedy Central, really. You're on some other lineup. And, um, and I wasn't trying to be a comic. I was trying to, I'm an actor. And I had found what I thought was a reality for this guy. And uh, and they didn't, so I was cast. And then they brought me back uh, to do another episode. And that show was deadly to do because in the two weeks I filmed it, they fired at least three people. You know, if, they, if you didn't get a line right or they didn't like it, you were out. Wow. I mean, $2,500 or $5,000 did not mean anything to them. We'll get another actor. We'll get, get it what we want. And uh, on the night we filmed, the one night I remember, Woody Allen and Diane Keaton were in the audience. So this was not like Home Improvement, where a lot of people from Iowa were in the audience. 
this was the industry in the audience, and that's also a killer. Wow. But I did very well after that. Meg Lieberman was the casting director with Bob Hirschfeld. And uh, after that, I actually did fairly well for quite a while because it was a prestige show. And, yeah. you know, I, this was funny. I walked in to read for Married with Children, a show I loathed, loathed <laughs> everything about it. I thought it was sexist, distasteful. It was nothing about it I liked. But I had two kids in private school, $30,000 a year, now 90 if I were still in L.A. And I needed money. It's not like I could go, uh, I'm above this. Sort of, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, just show me the script. Is it union? You got me. So, but I go in for Married with Children, and I'd hit a few things, and I was a record run of home improvement and making pretty good money. And I read this scene, and they loved me. They really loved me. Now, as I used to tell my actors when I was training them, the only thing you do when you audition is not be truthful. How old are you? How old do you think I am, sweetheart? I mean, it's none of your business. You're not legally allowed to ask me that unless you think I'm under 18. And if I'm over 18, it's none of your business. So you don't ever tell people your age. You, you know, there's no reason. And, and all other things. So then they'll ask you at an audition. Let's say I'm auditioning for Married with Children. So they'll say, um, what have you been doing with yourself? I've been in New York. I'm working on this off-off Broadway show. It takes place in an island with people who, they are sleeping. They are knitting lamb chop, and it's awful. But you don't say, I, well, this is what I did on Married with Children to not get the job. They said, so what have you been doing? I said, well, I just guest starred on Seinfeld for the second time. And I'm a regular on home improvement out. And I knew that was the case. I mean, I knew how to get rid of the job without saying, I hate your show. <laughs> and I got out of it by saying what you never say on an audition for television. You don't tell them what you're really doing. You tell them you're doing off-Broadway. And then if you're auditioning in New York, you never tell them you're doing Seinfeld. Oh, really? You're one of those television people, aren't you? <laughs> so instead, you know, you, yeah, you do, though, but you don't want them thinking you're working to get into Wicked. You're auditioning on Broadway. So, you know, learning the tricks of this trade, very complicated. My two sons did it. They were after a sag in utero. And my older son is still doing it. My younger son got out. They both got out sort of at puberty, but then the older one came back in. And the younger one, no so. But the younger one had done two series, one with Don Rickles and uh, Richard Lewis. And uh, he was in Jerry Maguire. That's a very funny story. He is oh, getting it. Yeah, yeah, show, yeah, show me the money. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he, yeah, he did well um, on that. But this is a family, family friendly show. I can't actually tell you <laughs> how the audition for Jim <laughs> we'll, we'll say that for the after show. There you we'll go. We'll do that for All the right. after show. All right. So, anyway, I got out of doing Mary. I would say of the 200 shows, I was a little unhappy about doing Say by the Bell, although my two kids said, You're on Say by the Bell? That made me a real actor. Wow. Well, not, not fine, Phil. Let, let's talk a little bit about theater because people remember you from things like Seinfeld and, and Home Improvement and things like that. Um, and 21 Jump Street I found out today, so that got me really excited. But you actually have a background in theater as well. And Matt and I are huge theater aficionados. We both have a background in theater. And where did you go to school or where did you study? I'm from Virginia. So, uh, uh, yeah. And in, you study at a school? Just, or in in or Hopewell. Private? Just in, in Hopewell, Virginia. So not at ah, university. Really? Yeah. Great. But, I yeah. <laughs> started at the Sarah Jenkins Academy for Tom Flory and Getting By. And I uh, took my college to Bryan College. So yeah, yeah he did a lot at Bryan College. Jobs. Yeah, I ran a theater, uh, community theater program here locally for a number of years. So that was very uh, In Nashville? Uh, just outside of Nashville in Dixon. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Rick, you know, has two daughters living in Nashville. I heard and, that. Yeah. And and I met Rick. Uh, that's another story, which we'll do at some point. But how I got involved in theater, 
as I say, I was doing, I was sort of, uh, my parents were from Ireland. They, they didn't read or write. There were no books in the house. In fact, when my mother uh, was, was a waitress at a restaurant chain called Horn and Hard Art, she's long gone, but she said to me when I was 10 or 11, she said, just think by when you're 16, you can quit school and I'll get you a job as a busboy here in the restaurant. And I'm thinking, I'm sorry, <laughs> what? what is it we're doing? I mean, I was thinking about that recently. Generations of kids grow up. People who come to this country from Poland or Israel or whatever, they never belong. I mean, they just never belong. They, 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 don't, know, they don't know who they are. Their kids don't belong either. I mean, until I was 40, people would say, well, what are you? I said, I'm Irish. I wouldn't say I'm an American. That never crossed my mind. I was Irish. And then later I thought, no, I guess I'm an American citizen, aren't I? My sons, of course, who had an Irish father, an Irish-American father and a Jewish wife, they never thought of themselves as many, you know, Americans. Yeah. So they're fine. They, they were never hurt. So uh, anyway, my mother thought I'd be fine being a busboy. That didn't work for me. Uh, and then I got involved in theater in high school because <clears throat> I went to an all-boys Catholic school. And I wasn't an athlete, so the only way I was going to meet girls was if I did shows. So it's first a great thing I reason did to get in. There you go. <laughs> I mean, Oklahoma, 1953 at St. Mary's Academy. Will Parker, <laughs> we're up to date in Kansas City. I was ready. And then I did uh, Ten Little Indy. Oh, that's a funny story. It was my first show in LaSalle High School. And on opening night, this is how bad this show was. I was playing the romantic lead. Now, as I used to tell my students, it's very important to recognize how people see you. It doesn't mean you have to live up to it. You have to understand when you walk into a room, what's their first response to you? I was always seen as neuter. I was always seen, I never got to kiss the girl. I never got to kiss the horse. I never got to kiss anyone. <laughs> I was always the guy with not even a dog, you know. Matt has that problem always, too. No, I'm kidding. Well, you know, it happens. <laughs> and he's going to make a lot of money out of it. But, <laughs> but not working here with you. But meanwhile, that's. <laughs> oh, anyway, I did tell the little Indians. And at the end of the first act, um, two people have died. And Philip Lombard who is the guy who's playing, says, looks at the poem over the mantelpiece and says, Ten little Indians sat up very late. Two overslept themselves and then there were eight. Overslept themselves. Overslept themselves. That last part fits Mr. and Mrs. Rogers rather perfectly, doesn't it? Now I freeze. It's opening night. There's 600 nuns and priests in the audience. And this is 1958. And I have said that last fart pits Mr. and Mrs. Rogers rather perfectly. And there's like stone silence. What do I do I'm now? Proud. So I thought <laughs> maybe theater is like a movie. I think I'll go back and fix this problem. Oh, no. <laughs> so I started again. Channel, but now I'm sweating. There's sweat coming out of sweat. And we're all smoking. All these 17-year-old kids are smoking. <laughs> and so I go, Ten little Indians sat up very late. Two overslept themselves. And then there were eight. Overslept themselves. <laughs> overslept themselves. That last fart fist. Now I screamed it. <laughs> I got 30 days detention. They were convinced that I did it deliberately to offend. 30 nuns. days detention? 30 days, I had to show up at 7 a.m. and write every other letter upside down in different colored ink. Wow. Wow. Now, talk about a bad review. Now, I've had a lot wow. of bad reviews because you work enough. You know? Well, all Mr. <laughs> all Mr. Cronin had to do last night, as Woody Mahoney and Finian's Rainbow was saying, he couldn't. Uh, that was a good one I liked. <laughs> um, Mr. Cronin sang the haunting cold porter melodies flatter than Twiggy. That, that I thought was a pretty good, pretty, my worst L.A. Times. Oh, no. I'm starring in a very prestigious theater, one of the waivers. 
and I'm playing Pat in The Hostage by Brendan Behan. And I thought I was rather right for this, actually. And I thought I was doing rather well. And so I opened. Audience seemed to like it well enough. But we had a woman reviewing for the LA Times. It was, unfortunately, it's only one person. And the next day in the Times, I read, Mr. Cronin as Pat in The Hostage was the worst stage Irishman in the history of the Los Angeles theater. <laughs> wow. So now oh. I have five auditions that day. <laughs> and every room I walk into, there's 20 people reading that review going, oh, there he is. No. There he is. That's the one. <laughs> so, but if you can't. That's, you, that's when you go, no, oh, that was my brother, Pete. Probably. Yeah, Pete Cronin. Pete, he got yes. some name wrong. Yeah. yeah, he's terrible. Awful guy. Awful. But as I tell the students, if you can't handle that kind of, a lot of people don't do this business because they can't handle the rejection. It really is as simple as that. I mean, yeah. They they have the talents. I've met hundreds of talented people, but if you tell them, God, you were not good last night, that they 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 just can't they can't do it. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard to get to a place where you know you can look past that and and keep going, you know, because sometimes it, it can really get you down. But, well, sure, I and mean, it's it, it hurts, you know. I mean, I've gotten great reviews too, but if you work a lot, yeah. you're yeah. going to get bad ones. <laughs> right, and that just means that you're you're putting yourself out there and you're doing more and more. And you know, if somebody is feels strong enough to give you a bad review, obviously there was an emotional connection there somewhere. <laughs> So, yeah, well, the young woman in the LA Times did not like me, so that know. was uh, that was sure. So, in any event, I finally uh, went to college. Uh, oh, this is funny. I was 18, and my last act before I gave up being a performer to become an actor, I had an act with a stripper. Now, this is 1959, so this is really PG 13. This is family <laughs> fair, folks. <laughs> So I would go out on the stage and we played three clubs in the Philadelphia area. O'Shea's Wagon Wheel in Darby, someplace in Wilmington. Anyway, we had these three clubs we played in our circle. And essentially I would come out and I looked very kind of Catholic schoolboy. And I wore a white dinner jacket and bow tie. And I sang Unchained Melody while Rose LaRose took her clothes off, for which we got $200 a weekend when the average worker was making 80 bucks a week to kill themselves 40 hours in the, you know, shop. Wow. So I did that for six months and I thought, well, this isn't going anywhere really. I mean, and so then I went to college and, uh, and that's another interesting, I, I love telling my Appalachian students this story. I was 18 and I went from Catholic school and, um, cause I was Catholic and, my parents didn't care what I did as long as I was Catholic <laughs> and were annoyed I turned down the bus boy job. <laughs> so then I get a 1349 SAT, uh, AC, SAT score, which back in 1959, there was no Kaplan or any of that. You either, you took it once and you got what you got. Well, 1349 in 1959 would have got me into Harvard anywhere. And so, I only applied to two schools, LaSalle College, which was Catholic, and and uh, Princeton, because it was very close to where I lived, and I liked it. It was pretty. <laughs> so I got into the pretty school as well as the Catholic school. So I went up to Princeton, and I had lunch at the Nassau Inn, where George Washington actually slept. And there's, you know, several hundred of us all sitting down as potential Princetonians. And I look down and there's a plate. Okay, I'm with you. And there to my left, though, are two forks. What, what would anyone need a second fork for? I'm trying to think this through now. I'm 18. <laughs> I've got a mother who wants to lose the first one. one. Everybody knows that. I thought it was to stab um, people. Oh, wait, you're well, not supposed to do I that. Thought. I, I thought. thought. Two very different this is to stab the Italian guy. 
Well, you never know when somebody's going to come out of nowhere. You might need to protect yourself. I mean, that, keep no. a spare fork just in case. That's my motto. No, I didn't go to Princeton because of the second fork. Oh. And I, I mean, and I dealt with many a student in Appalachia, you know, who went, oh, they're bad. They, you know, I said, <laughs> you go out to L.A. with that accent and <laughs> you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be, and I sent three or four people out, mostly techs, you know, film editors and the like, who are really talented. But they go out there and go, you know, oh, what's going on here? You know? <laughs> and I said, if you can handle it, the hell of them, you know, speak whatever, whatever you want. But they're cruel, those people out there in the Armani suit land, and they're not going to take kindly to your accent, I can assure you. And any more than I took kindly or understanding of the fork. And I said, there's no difference between your accent and my not getting a fork. <laughs> so I went to Catholic college because I was comfortable there. And it was yeah. fine. I, that's how I got involved in theater. They had a good theater thing going on. And yeah. I did Guys and Dolls was my first show. And then I did Leave It to Jane. And then I had one of those epistemological moments, as we say in the pretension game. Um, Philly was a tryout town, so anything that was worthwhile was on the way to New York, tried out in Philly and Boston. So in one week, I saw Patty Chayefsky's Gideon with uh, Frederick March and Douglas Campbell, whom I became friends with years later. He was one of the greatest actors to come out of Canada, and he played Gideon. And then on, and I saw that on Wednesday at a matinee. And on Saturday at the Walnut Street Theater, I saw Paul Schofield, Albert Decker, and George Rose in A Man for All Seasons. And I sat, as I was eight, 19 years old, and as I sat through those two, at one point, Frederick March plays God in the play Gideon. And he says uh, to Gideon, and I, I'm remembering this, I was 19, so it's, 70 years ago, right? No, not quite 60. <clears throat> and he says, Gideon, passion is the very fact of God and man. I must own yours was an old and settled soul, and I had to blow on you to burn up the least bit of fire. So why did you love me, God? I'm an ordinary man. Well, that's the reason I love you. I love men's ordinariness. And I, I, I've not studied the play. I didn't study that line. But it, it, it embedded itself. And I'm sure both of you have had, whether it's with a comic or a play or a ballet, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what yeah. enriches you that way. And then the same thing at the Wall Street with Scott, Schofield and George Rose. And I thought, my God, this, this is life. This is really what life is. And, and that was it for me. And, uh, Alas, the difficulty now becomes um, I develop a drinking problem, not unlike dear old dad. So from 18 to 32, I drank between two and four fifths of whiskey a day. So I was in a blackout every day, I was, but I was on stage. I did 150 plays, mostly not knowing where I was like Barrymore, not as good as Barrymore, but he had the same issue. He didn't know what he was doing, but it went out on stage. And I'd have people come up saying, you were great last night. And I thought, really? Had what, I wonder? Was I? <laughs> was, I? Was, I? was I really great? And Where was I, I last just night? Say, I just say, thank you. Yeah. And uh, so as of August 19th of this year, I am 49 years without a drink. That is wonderful. And con yeah, congratulations. Well, we would be doing this. So yeah, well, yeah. Funny. Well, so, okay. let's uh, let's get into our improv segment. Well, All right. oh, wait, wait. wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. I did, yeah. I did want to ask. Um, yeah, this is my show, Sarah. Shush. Um, <laughs> I did want to ask, Patrick, you know, you've given us a smattering of your career in both television and theater. I was wondering, do you have a preference one way or another? Which is your favorite? Any particular roles that you enjoyed more than the other? Well, I and feel why, do you, like, why do you enjoy it so much? Well, I mean, I feel like Grand O'Neill and Newman, I'm not in their league, obviously, but uh, they were theater giants and never did it again uh, once they got the chance to not do it. Uh, there's something exciting about live theory, theater, 
But A, it doesn't pay very well. I mean, even now, if you're working on Broadway, you're making 2000 is, is equity minimum. If you want rents are like in New York, I mean, so you're making 8000 a month. You're living in Astoria, if you're lucky. And there's no fun to it. There's no fun to it. I mean, I was like, you know, making a lot of money doing dinner theater. I toured with Betty Grable, Dorothy Lamour, Artie Johnson, Tap Hunter. And I was making 500 a week in the 70s. It was great money. But, you know, you're not, it's just it. You're on the road and it's, you know. But I went to L.A. and all of a sudden it's like, I can do this and also have a middle class life. I mean, I got married. My wife was on Happy Days and Wonder Woman. She was March the Car Up on Happy Days, and she was Etta Candy on Wonder Woman. And, uh, she was George Kaufman's granddaughter. You can't take it with you, the man who came to dinner once in a lifetime. So it was a great life. We had a, then at 47, she got lung cancer from treatment she had for Hodgkin's, and she died almost five years later. And we had two sons, James and Charlie. And uh, so, you know, that sort of put an end to that stage of life. And uh, then I was offered a teaching job at East Tennessee State because I had a friend who was there. And uh, I thought, well, why not? I like people and I like acting. And so I was going to stay three years and I retired after 20. Wow. And that's how I met Rick. He came to audition for me for uh, Christmas Carol. And he played Scrooge, and we've been like blood brothers ever since. He's one of the best friends I've ever had. Matt has a Christmas Carol story because he will never forgive me because I didn't cast him as Scrooge, and he got cast as Fred, and he just has never let that go, ever. Well, he (laughs) made up for it by casting as the lead in everything, and for some strange reason still casting the stuff to this day. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So... Well, you both seem very happy together, like a good marriage should be. And so often isn't. We have some questions. The cool thing about doing a live stream is that we have some questions that are, are coming right now from our live audience. And oh, Cheryl, I didn't, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This that is exciting. Cool. Cheryl asks, what is the greatest constructive criticism you've received and who gave that to you? And did it change anything about your craft? I was doing Red at Burnsville in North Carolina, an equity guest artist contract, a play about Rothko. And the director was Andrew Gall, who's a Bridgman, Virginia guy right now. And uh, Andrew was directing me, and I thought I was pretty good in this. I felt good. And three days before we opened, Andrew says to me, Pat, I finally figured out your overall acting approach. I said, oh, really? Yeah, he said, you're so lovable. You really want everybody to love you. I thought, nothing wrong with this so far, I guess I can do. (laughs) And he said, Rothko, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Rothko one of the most hateful people you've ever met? Well, yes, yes, that's true. So three days later, I took that note it was kind as it was presented it it was a note (laughs) and three days later in the Asheville Gazette it was said Mr. Cronin gave one of the most hateful characterizations we've seen in this area in a brilliant performance as Rothko and I wouldn't have gotten that performance without Andrew Gall wow that's how it works when it's good when it's really good Yeah. yeah yeah yeah, and we have um, Ivan and Karen have some similar questions about how you handle um, challenging circumstances and also um, harsh criticism or bad reviews. So, what would be your advice well, to people for that? You know, again, to get sober, I had to look in the mirror and say, finally, um, I've got to stop caring what other people think about me. If I'm going to live a life in which I'm going to just be concerned about are they seeing the pimple on my nose? Um, there's no going to be any point to my life, is there? And I, I can't just stay drunk. That's not going to work. So if somebody says you're the worst stage Irishman in the history of the Los Angeles theater, as you pointed out, at least she had a, a feeling about it. And I, that day I had five auditions and booked three jobs out of those five. 
So if you, you really just have to handle it. If you can't handle it, then you can't be a professional. That's why people stay in community theater where only people who love them comment and they could be wonderful. Yeah. But if you get out there, you, you go to LA or New York or Chicago, people are going to go, he's no, I mean, I walked into a room one day and the guy says, who the hell is this? I mean, as if there was not even a person there. I mean, they don't treat you as a person most of, many of the times. And, and, uh, You've got to handle it. You, you know, you have to find what is inside. It could be religion, I suppose, spirituality. Uh, or it can just be, I finally at peace with myself. I mean, at 81, there isn't very much that would affect me now. I'm, I have two sons and a grandson. and I'm, I'm married again to a wonderful woman whom I adore. And um, I've had a wonderful life, They're really great. And, and I stand up, you know, sometimes like with Andrew, it was kindly presented, but it was a legitimate takedown of what I was doing because I do like to be loved. I mean, if I'm not communicating that, you guys aren't as astute as I think you are. So, I mean, it is need, I am needful of applause. You, why do we get into it? Well, I'm not here, I don't exist. Oh, now I'm here. Okay, now I'm here. Well, eventually, you can't keep doing it for that reason. Eventually, I started to do the work for myself. And if the audience liked it, Uta Hagen, who's the genius of acting teachers, respect for acting is the textbook. And Uta says in it, when she was doing Seagull, she said, I understand exactly what Chekhov wants. So at the end of that play, when I exit, I know how to exit to get a standing ovation. Or if I'm true to Chekhov, I know how to exit in deadly silence. And she said there were some nights when I needed the applause. Some nights when I was insecure and I wanted to know, and then I would take the kind of exit that would drive them to their seats. But most nights she said, thank God, I took the Chekhovian exit. And I eventually, and again, nowhere in the new league with Udo Hoggett, but eventually as I started to like Red, even there, I mean, I was, yes, trying to be loved, but once it was pointed out that Roscoe was a hateful individual, I got better with it. And uh, in fact, the best stage performance I gave was as Jamie in Long Day's Journey and Tonight. And I invited a teacher from Catholic U, Teddy Hanfield, to come and see me because I wanted her evaluation. And I was so excited when she came backstage and, and the audiences were loving it. And I felt good in it. And I said, so Teddy, what, what did you think? She said, well, Pat, you were so busy crying for yourself and crying for Jamie that you didn't let any of us do any work at all. And, well, I didn't have a chance to fix it there. <laughs> she was right. I, I, it was self-indulgent. I have a danger in emotional material. I've done Willie Loman four times. And each time when I get to, you know, you know, uh, the scene with Biff, you know, Bob, I'm nothing on it. Uh, last time I did it, I did with my son in Ireland. He said, I'm nothing, Bob. I'm a black and hour. I tried seven state. I couldn't race it. And for me, the, the, the pain of it as an audience member is so intense that I become less Willie and more Pat Cronin. And that's, I don't know, at 81, it's probably a trap I'm not going to get out of. <laughs> but there it is. But again, I hope I, you know, you have to face the critiques. And if it matters to you, you'll give up. And if, if you can live past it, then you'll, give, you'll do good work. You'll, you'll do the best work you can do. Yeah. Which would you say is your favorite? Um, like if there's a role you could do again just because of how much you enjoyed it. Like, well, Willie, Willie is such a challenge. And, and I did it four times. First time I was 19, which was nonsense, except it was a very good performance. I did it again at 27. Not a good production. I wasn't very good. Then I did it again at 60, and it was pretty good, except Belinda was not good. See, trouble with theater, 
you're only as good as the other ball players. And and I didn't have a Linda. She was terrified of me. She was a student. And I, and she was fine in the scenes with boys, but with me, she went, hi, Willie. I mean, I thought, oh, God, please, oh, wow. please, you know, we've got to find this relationship. So, again, I'm too old to do Willie now. I would like to do James Tyrone in all days, a role I could do. But unfortunately, in my 40s, I turned down Hickey and Iceman in L.A. because I spent three days trying to learn that 45 minute monologue and i got scared to answer your friend who said what do you do when you're terrified uh quit yeah. <laughs> or as, Len as lenny bruce used to say don't be a baby be a man sell out yeah. <laughs> so i i yeah. sold out <laughs> wow 45 minutes man mm -hmm. 45 minute monologue Oh, man. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I Brutal. saw Nathan Lane do it in Brooklyn. He was extraordinary. And and um, what's his name from Salesman um, from Chicago? Uh, Brian Denny was brilliant oh, yeah. as Larry Slade. Yes, 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 yes. Now, there's an actor. There's an actor. Yes. I cried. When, the day he died, never met him. No idea. Saw him on stage several times. Uh, saw him in a lot of films. I saw him. I just saw it. I thought, we, we've, we've lost something here. Yes. And that's, uh, that's the beauty of art. My wife and I were saying it today. One of the beautiful things about COVID is it's kind of forced all of us, I think, to be more creative. I'm feeling more creativity among people than I did when everybody was, you know, pushing the 60-hour week. And am I going to run this company? I think less people care anymore. And, and realizing happens, how important it is, I think we our perspective really changed. We were able to focus in on the things that are so important to us, the things yes. that really matter. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know. James in long days I would like to do. Age-wise, I'm okay for that. Um, I've done Grandpa, You Can't Take It With You, which I adore. And I wouldn't mind doing that again, just because it's fun to do, and I'm the right age. Uh, I have not done on Golden Pond, which is not a great play, but I'm the right age. <laughs> you know, there's no sense, God, if I could only do Romeo one more time. Oh, oh there. That's a funny story. Star Trek TNG, last season, I played Urko, the Minister of Culture of the most boring planet in the universe. And Marjo Bartlett, who's Gene Roddenberry's widow, did a series of episodes, not like unlike George on Seinfeld, where they get hired and fired in the same episode. So she was going to get married in eight separate episodes, eight different guys. So she was going to marry my boss, who's the minister of the most boring planet in the universe. And so she comes to the wedding ceremony naked in some Etruscan, I don't know. And of course, I was playing next to him and standing there, and I put my, my hands in front of his eyes. Anyway, it was great fun doing that show. And it was the last season, they were going nuts on that they do on a show that's in its winding down days. So Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frames started doing Romeo and, Romeo and Juliet in between takes. Oh, wow. So there we are on the main deck, and Patrick Stewart. An extraordinary actor, and Jonathan Frey's no small shelf either. So, actually, Stuart is up there doing a very brilliant Juliet. I mean, <laughs> they knew all the lines. And at one point, Romeo is saying, come to me, Juliet, come, silly night, scarf up the eyes, some other nonsense. <laughs> and Patrick leaps off the desk into Jonathan's <laughs> arms. We are howling, and Patrick looks around and says, please, I'm in touch with my feminine side. <laughs> <laughs> there oh, are aspects gosh. of working that can be really fun. And I, I love I that. I I should share that with you. Oh, thank great. you. Wow, that is, yeah. that's wonderful. Oh, man, yeah. I wish I could have been there. A fly on the wall on that oh, set, man. I mean, that's the sort of thing. Uh, like, I was shooting um, The Magnificent Seven, which is a TV western, on Gene Autry's ranch on the day Gene Autry died. Oh, wow. 
we had this whole celebratory dinner. They brought in food, and we all saw told Gene Autry's story. It was great. I mean, wonderful things happened in shows. Yeah, terrible things happened, no question. But I would say in the, you know, 100 years I've been doing this, uh, you know, working with Betty Grable, for example, was the number one box office star for 10 years. She had a couple of great stories. And the movie with Marilyn Monroe, um, How to Marry a Millionaire, Betsy, uh, Betty said, I walked out on the set and I saw Marilyn Monroe and I turned to my agent and I said, this is my last movie. <sighs> she never did another film. Wow. I mean, wow. she knew the crown was passing. Oh, man, man. And so she was, in a, she was dying of throat cancer, oh. still smoking like a chimney. And she loved to play poker. She was an amazing poker player. And she was had a boyfriend named Bobby, who was a dealer out of Vegas. And they loved each other. It was really very bizarre. Uh, and we used to play poker every night after the show. And, and I'm a decent poker player, but, you know, we're nickel dimes, right? So she didn't say much to the other cast, but if Bobby, her boyfriend, made a bad call, she said, you make another bid like that, I'm sending you back to Mary Martin. <laughs> <laughs> So we were. <laughs> so she turned to me one night. She said, "You know, you're a decent poker player." I mean, I was nowhere near an early. As in, well, not as an actor either, but she was an amazing personality. Uh, and she said, "I'm going to tell you a story." And I said, "Shit, I don't tell this to many people, but I think you'll appreciate it." I was in Vegas. And I was playing, and it was pot limit stakes poker, seven card. And there was no Texas Hold'em. We weren't in that era. And she said, and they're all there, Jack Warner, Harry Cohn. They're all, you know, and it's $75,000 in the pot. And the final round of cards dealt. And I'm looking at my hand, and I have the ace, king, queen, jack. 10 of spades. I have the only unbeatable poker hand. One, one in 675,000 for that hand to be dealt. And there's $75,000 in the pot. And she said, I'm getting ready to make a bid. And I'm probably going to bid a small amount. See if I can keep folks in. When the guy on my left, she wouldn't tell me who, has a heart attack. He falls out of his chair, cards fly into the air. He's grabbing his throat and she's looking at ace, king, queen, jack, 10 of spades. And everybody else is screaming now that the hand is null and void, right? She looks at him and she was a sweet and kind woman. So this story has to be told as fair she said, I looked at that guy, and I looked at that hand, and I thought to myself, I hope the son of a bitch dies. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. It's a rare hand. If she, had, if, she had, if she had said anything else, I would have never talked to her again. Because there is absolutely no other response. Oh, wow. 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 I mean... How are you going to get a hand like that again? You're not. You're you never. Know? You're and never. not at that money, not at those stakes. And of course, she was acting in plays because she and, and the trumpet player she was married to um, were broke because of gamble. I mean, they oh, were yeah. broke because of gambling, alas. And so she was still trying to make make a living. And she died three months later after, after that story. And then I started touring with Dorothy Lamour, who was her best friend. So we were on the road with a Noel Coward show called Fallen Angels. So I said, what was it like with Betty in the last days? She said, it was really strange. I said, how? She said, well, I saw her every day. Anyway, just before she died, she, I mean, she was dying. I mean, you know, there was no question. We knew she was dying when we were two. She looked at Dorothy and she said, I didn't believe it. And those were her last words. I didn't believe it. So then I started to think, I've got to come up with a great last line. 
Yes. I didn't believe it isn't good. So, uh, <laughs> so far, I've only got Oscar Wilde's last line. As he was dying, he looked up and said, either that wallpaper has to go or I... <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'm using so, that one. I will stay with that one. <laughs> there you go. I can't find my own. Well, Brendan let's, Behan's, let's, Brendan oh, Behan's oh, was great. Brendan Behan's was great. He was dying in a Dublin hospital filled with nuns. And he turned oh, no. and he said, and he said, sister, may all your children be bishops. Oh. And then he died. <laughs> so if I'm in the right circumstance, I might steal that one. Well, Matt, you need a you need a good one now. You're gonna have to yeah, really already, think about this I've one. I've thought about it for a couple of days actually, and the only one I keep coming back to is saying something stupid. Like I like to think I'd be profound and wise yeah. in my last moments. I'm probably gonna look at my family right in the face and go, "Told you I was sick." And then, <laughs> That's not bad. Her off. So you didn't believe. And then it. we still won't believe yeah. it. Like days later, we'll they won't. we'll be calling. You know, no. And, <laughs> They'll be like, he did that to spite us, I swear. Yes. Yeah. Well, we have we have some some exciting things happening right now. So I don't know. Are you guys ready for some improv? Sure. Yes, Matt, please. Yes. Well, Matt, are you well, rusty or you got your chops ready for, for tonight? We're about to find out in a hot We're going to find out. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we have uh, some uh, improv prompts coming in from the chat. Okay. and from audience people and so i think what we're going to be doing is we're going to be answering questions based on serious questions okay real questions we're going to answer real questions like answer for yourself. all three of us but <laughs> we're going to have a, a a way that we have to answer the questions okay so uh my producer jill is over here she is just ready and waiting with uh, all of these <laughs> and I think they're going to pop up here on uh, on the screen here. Oh. Ruin the best place oh. you visited by describing it as an obnoxious American tourist. Oh, man. Go. Right. Go, <laughs> Matt. Do it. Okay. <laughs> it's not quite popping up for me. So ruin the best place. The best we place you've visited. ever visited by describing it as an obnoxious American tourist. Okay. Oh, uh, bro. <laughs> so I just I just got back from this place called it's called Saint Augustine, Aug Augustine. Uh, yeah, dude. And I'm yeah, like, Colorado, bro, right? Bro. Yeah, yeah, man. Like <laughs> somewhere around there, there was like. There was a beach and uh, mm. you know, there was sand and uh, there, there was also water. That's a beach though. Um, Why'd you go so, to Myrtle yeah. Beach? We had, I don't know anyone named Myrtle. What are you talking oh, about? Myrtle, not Sorry. Myrtle. What? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, Myrtle? I'm a traveler just like you, dude. Oh, okay, good. Okay, you'll appreciate this. So but we went to this uh, this this beach and it had a lot of, uh, had a lot of sand and uh, bro, the, the drinks were, they tasted like the beach because there was, I think they put salt water in the drink and they called it, they called it the beach. And, uh, there was also like a couple of, uh, there's also a couple of bars that you can visit, uh, by the beach. And, uh, but like there was sand, like bro, they had sand, sand at the, the beach. Like, I felt, I, I know I felt <laughs> like, I felt like I was like in, Florida or something uh, like I was wow. in the Tahiti's or whatever. Like, Don't say you know, gay. I oh oh well, <laughs> we said a lot. I don't think I don't know what we said to be completely honest. Like it was a lot of a lot of uh, uh, water and sand and, and beaches and drinks and well, yeah, you gotta go check it out sometime. Like if you like beaches, if you're a I don't know if you're a mountain person or a beach person. But there's mountains down there too, bro. Like uh, like uh, uh. Well, there's a lot of sand well, making it into mountains. I so, got one yeah. better than that. I got one way better than Go that. Now, it. what's your name? Maddie? Maddie? Is your name Maddie? I can't see right there on the screen. Went to the Romanian yeah. Colosseum. That place was huge, gigantic. Romanian's a salad. Let me tell you, you can just slip right in there and disappear. Oh, my goodness. Man, that, that Romanian Colosseum. I tell you what, had to be. Was it all broken? The what? 
Wasn't it all broken up? It, you know, somebody done chipped a piece off that stone yes. up there. Well, that oh, was man. Rob, did they use, sister? <laughs> I do. All the time. Well, had a great hot dog at the stand next door. Man, lots of mustard and ketchup and relish. Oh, it was good times. It was good times. I was at this canyon out there in Colorado, and I remember looking at that. It was big. And I said to my kids, don't mind. Don't get out of the car. We'll look at the video I'm taking, and it'll be better. <laughs> and I was right. I mean, you don't need a real place, you know. You, you just have a no, camera. No, sir. No, sir. Granddad, you don't know how to use a camera. We I missed the push. whole thing. What? Who are you? Where did this you again? Come? It's your grip. I was in the back. You still here? <laughs> I was trying to tell. I was trying to tell you we should pull over. You're like, nah. I got a camera. You never use a camera day in your life. I thought you were at the beach. <laughs> <clears throat> Sandy Beach. Oh, so we're not changing it. up. Okay. <laughs> I see. All right, who else have we got? It's improv. Roll with it, Matt. Yeah, the, what rule, the rules, there are no rules to improv, so none yeah. were explained. Right. So. No rules. It's improv. There are no rules in improv. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Right, what's this one? Tell us about your favorite holiday as a scene from a horror movie. Oh, yeah. I'll let Sarah take this one first. All right. Yes. Your favorite holiday. All right. Let's see, I'm going to decorate this mantle here. I'm proper London Christmas. Here we go. I'm ready. I'm ready. And then. Ah! Oh! Oh! It's a bearded man! It's a bearded man! Oh! Oh! Okay. Thank goodness. And that's all you get. Christmas spirit. <laughs> that's, that's it. Jesus, oh, my goodness. And my chair is going to fall apart. That's all you get. Uh, let's That's see. Hilarious. The wonderful thing about St. Patty's Day is when, Jesus, that's a big elf. That's a big stick. Ah! No! Not Pat! Save him! <laughs> Quick, anyway. Welcome to my dinner that we call Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I have prepared for you a succulent dish. It's called a turkey. It's probably dead. We're going to find out. Sit down and relax. There's nothing to be afraid of here. You can eat all you want, all you like. Say all afternoon. Would you like some meat? I've also got plenty of sides prepared. Oh, it doesn't... Wait, where are you going? Sit down. Are you vegan? Is it the gluten? I'm sure we could think of something. You know, they say you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. I don't watch horror, so I don't know. I felt like we were going to have some, <laughs> some fava beans and a nice Chianti there for a minute. <laughs> All right, what well, we got? Let's see. Oh, okay, so oh no. Back. With the confusion of a passionate librarian... Tell us which book you would take if you were stranded on a desert island. Hmm. I, think, I think it's Pat's turn to go first. Well, I've spent most of my time here in Kokomo Library here in, in rural Vermont, where I deal with a lot of young people who come in and they ask for very timid little books. But someday, I'll be by myself, and I'll be on a little island, maybe we're near Matt's beach, with lots of sand, and I'll take with me D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. <laughs> now, you might ask why, but that would only be for the people who have not read Lady Chatterley's Lover. And then you can see that my life may have been quiet, but it was also filled with dreams. <laughs> really good dream. Good night. I can't. <laughs> it was great. 
Can you imagine? Yeah, so I, was, like, I went back to that beach recently. There was like this old guy. He had like, I think it was a, one of those book things that looked so deep. Like he looks so, so profound, bro. Like <laughs> it just t- peacefully reading there on the beach. Like I, I can't. I was literally like, oh my gosh, he looks so cool right now. I don't know what it said because I can't read, but you know, it looked fine, you know. So. Maybe I'll, no, I can't read it. I won't ask him for it. I'll just ask him to read it to me, like, yeah. if we ever get on that level, so. <laughs> yeah, well, that one time I went to your beach there, Matt, I'm going to tell you right now, I read this book, and I got all sunburnt because I was sitting out there so long. I got so engrossed in this thing where this guy, man, this guy was leading this girl all along. I mean, she didn't know what was happening. She was just falling for all of his just you know, tricks, and and, I mean, I think he might have been a narcissist, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, this guy had her all snowed over, and then she agreed to marry him, and next thing you know, he's got this crazy wife in the attic, but I'll tell you what, I'll take that book back to the beach again, in a heartbeat. Amen. (laughs) Keep them rolling, keep them rolling. (laughs) Oh, 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 (laughs) y'all. Channeling the spirit of Julia Child, describe your favorite meal. I actually have a Julia Child bit that I do. Let's hope it can come out today. Good. <laughs> I have no idea who this person is. Oh, you don't? Oh. So I'm, I'm about to find out. So. Well, now first, you have to stuff the chicken really good with this, get the stuffing in the chicken. And you have to push it down in there because if you don't get the stuffing in there just right, it won't cook well. It needs oil, oil on the outside of it, so it will brown in the oven. And and now, now you just have to wait. You have to wait for the chicken to to bake all perfectly, and then you will serve it. You'll serve it alongside your fresh vegetables. Bon appetit. Very nice. Very nice. <clears throat> I think that too many people eat only fancy things they don't understand. So I like to cook indigenous meals for the local people, even when I'm not there. For example, tonight I am preparing scrapple. If you've never been to Philadelphia, this is a must eat. Scrapple is a kind of mush made up of things most people throw away, but they form it into a big mound and then they cut it into slices, fry it in a lot of grease, and it has a lot of grease in it. And then before you eat Scrapple, every diner in Philadelphia serves it with eggs, very badly done, but I will serve it with corn muffins and a little bit, perhaps, I don't know, maybe a little bit of good coffee, perhaps, uh, to go with it. But scrapple is the kind of thing you can only eat if you're drunk. <laughs> As a Philadelphian, that's just a oh, true wow. statement. Not a very good Julia child. Yours was wonderful. Oh, well, Matt, yes. give it a try. Just come and gather round, you never yeah, that's good. It. It's a dish, it's all the rage in Italy. It's an Italian flatbread with various toppings on top. First, you need to take yourself a bread dough of some sort, and I'm going to make it nice and round so it fits in the oven, yes. And now, we put whatever or what sort of you put the sauce on it. We're going to put a little cheese Wait, no, it's not a pizza, it's an Italian flatbread. Pizza's a vile food that you'll find in New York City for the uncivilized. And then we're going to put... Don't call it pizza. Stop calling it pizza right now. This is an Italian flatbread. It's all the rage in Italy. I've been there twice. Then we're going to put everything we want on the vegetables and peppers and... Oh, my God, it's a pizza. <laughs> Very nice. I would like to apologize to the late, great Julia Child. Um, (laughs) No, I'm kidding. Oh, somebody is asking in the chat if that was Mrs. Doubtfire. (laughs) Why not? Sure. I don't know. 
Yeah, it, it could have been. <laughs> Apparently, oh. it was on that Facebook. Was my impression of Sarah doing an impression of Julia Child. <laughs> Again, perfect. I apologize, Julia. I meant no harm. No, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. I did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I'm watching it come through. Oh, wow. Explain as an evil genius at what age you would freeze yourself if you became immortal. That is a ridiculous question. Obviously, the correct answer is you would freeze yourself as, as a toddler. That way you could unfreeze yourself whenever society was great and perfect. But look at me. I'm too old and fat. I've already had the perfect time to become a specimen in the future. So, now we have to go to backup plan where I'm going to freeze my children. And then I will freeze myself. And upon freezing myself, I will unfreeze myself when I deem it the appropriate time to unfreeze myself, to unfreeze my children in the perfect society. They will have years and years of growing up in a world free from things like pineapple on the pizza and uh, and the cancer and uh, and Jacksonville, Florida. They'll be free of such things and I'll get to watch them in my old age enjoy them. But I will enjoy myself because I am too old to enjoy it because I already passed. They force the days to freeze myself. So I take great offense at that question because I cannot accurately answer it in good content. Is that your Julia Child impression after 12 cups of coffee? Yes, it is. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. This Well, you see, I believe that I would freeze and refreeze in accordance with Matt's freezes and refreezes so that when he unfreezes, I can refreeze him so that we do not have to listen to his Julia I'll Child impression. I'll do it. You'll get brain freeze if you do it for any time. Believe me, I know. I, I want to freeze myself so I can see whatever happened to Walt Disney. Ooh. I want to see what it's like to be frozen right when you're dying of a lot of disease. I always don't like to be frozen when I can know that people are looking at me and wondering what has happened to him and to me. That's terrifying. Wow. Anyway. Wow. <laughs> it is. Wow. I was in Dr. Giggles, remember, so I okay. know it's terrifying. <laughs> also, right. yes, all my fellow Floridians, I did just call Jacksonville a great evil of popular. Well, I, and, I used to live there. I can do that. So. But just so you all know, Matt too. criticizes Florida all the time. So I think, you know, everyone send him some hate messages. No, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> the only thing you're allowed to send me from Florida are Disney tickets. Thank you very much. Well, let's do one more. I think we have time for one more. Oh, oh, so, uh, oh, the producer is having a hard time deciding over here. <laughs> oh, no. that. What did we do? What have we done? Oh. Entertain the court of King Arthur with the story of one of your embarrassing moments. <laughs> I think it's Sarah's turn for this one. <laughs> wow. Entertain the court of King Arthur. Embarrassing moments. Oh, man. Well, Matt, you have way more embarrassing moments than I do. You should go first. <laughs> I went first. These are the rules. That there are no rules. So. Oh, man. All right. Let me think. I got to think of one first. Well, I can't, I can't think of anything other than what happened in, like, third grade. So I might go What did happen in third yeah. grade? Yeah, what happened to Well, I'm going to entertain the court of King Arthur. You've got to be quiet when I'm entertaining the court there, lad. All right, we're entertaining. We've got knights. Oh, all ye people of the round table. Listen one and all. Come hither. Come, come closer. And listen. Listen to the story of the young, the wee young girl about this tall. And she was 
frolicking in the parking lot after school. And then her best friend was there. And you see, there was a Prince Charming. And the wee little girl was quite in love with the Prince Charming, or at least she thought she was in third grade. And the wee little girl was all googly-eyed and cheerful, and the best friend ran up to the Prince Charming and told him that wee little girl was madly in love with him. And he ran away, like pretty boys do. And that was the most embarrassing moment of third grade. That's very sad. <laughs> Most of the ones I'm thinking of, I can't do on a family friendly no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um <laughs> And to do it in, our, in an Arthurian way, uh, actually, my favorite performance was as King Arthur in Camelot. <sighs> and uh, there's that, mm -hmm. glor that glorious speech at the end of Act One proposition. If I could choose from every woman who breathes upon this earth, the face I would most love, the smile, the touch, the voice, the laugh, the heart, the soul and self, every detail and feature down to the smallest strand of hair, they would all be Jenny's. If I could choose from every man who breathes upon this earth, a man for my brother, a man for my son, a man for my friend, they would all be lads. I love them, and they answer me with pain and torment, be it sin or not sin. I see it in my eyes, they hear when they speak, and they will answer worse than be punished. I will not be wounded and not return it in kind. And that was my favorite moment on stage. I'm emotional. I'm not wow. emotional to do anymore. Wow. Yes, that was well, beautiful. it was. I don't know. I don't know. It's my terrible moments uh, auditioning. Well, I'm not sure I could do it or Arthurian, but I did this for a friend the other night. I had a big audition in New York, and getting out of Philly was important. And this was to tour with a show called Good News. It was starring Alan Seuss from Laughing, Big Al, the Kitty's Pal. And I go up to New York from Philadelphia. And I leave my picture, my resume, and my music on the train, which is going on to Boston. So now I walk into one of those audition places and there's 20 people behind a huge desk, gorgeous pictures and resumes on them. And I walk in and I do the kind of thing you can't do as a professional actor, really. And I'm 30 years old. And I thought, so I walk in and they look at me. And I'd had a friend who got me this audition. I said, I'm terribly sorry. But um, I left my picture, my resume and my music on the train that's now almost in Boston. And there's the terrible silence with who invited this guy in here. So the musical director said, well, what were you going to sing? I said, I was going to sing Green Snake from Take Me Along. He said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I don't know that. He said, can you sing anything else? Uh, I guess, uh, I, I could sing if ever I would leave you from, from Cam Camelot. The guy said, Broadway Key? I said, oh, absolutely, Broadway Key. Mm -hmm. If ever I would leave you, it wouldn't be in summer, singing in some flat, sharp, worst performance ever. So I finish. I thought, my God, how do I get out of here? So fortunately, there was a role in the show. I didn't know this. For a guy who didn't sing, he was a coach the football team. So the director thought, well, this guy's kind of crazy uh, a little bit. He said to me, do you tap dance? I said, yes, yes, I do. I, I had seven years of tap dance with Aunt Dorothy and Philly. I, and I started tapping. So I'm 30 years old and I'm tap dancing. And he said, um, could you do that with batons? Batons? Yes. 
I forgot my music, my picture, my resume. I just sang the worst song in the history of the American theater. I'm tap dancing, and you ask me if I can do it with the dots. I can do them if they were on fire. <laughs> I mean, that I didn't get shot was really the thing. So I get cast, and, and, <laughs> I, and it really was. And then I went with Alan to Jacksonville, Florida, that didn't send me no flowers at the Alhambra Dinner Theater, so which is still there and still operating. Oh, wow. But that was my most embarrassing moment as an adult. I mean, there's nothing worse than standing in front of a room of pros when you are looking like absolute amateur night and Dixie, the worst mm -hmm. possible audition. Mm -hmm. It never got any worse than that, thank God. That was, and I did get a job at it. Well, so, see, you need the one bad audition so that after that, going forward next time you can be like i know this won't be the worst one because i've already be had the worst one yep. yes so. i did my last broadway audition was to play Hugh jackman's father in boy from oz and unfortunately i had just had um throat cancer treatment i had throat cramp the cancer 21 years ago and but i'd had 90 days of radiation and so when I went up and I'd been working on this Australian accent and everything, and uh, it just did not go well. It did not go well at all. Um, but it was not, you know, it was embarrassing only in so far as I was not competitive. But um, auditions are a terrible process, especially, uh, you know, for really good you know, good parts or in good situations. I mean, God, to have played Hugh Jackman's father would have been heaven, you know, but it didn't happen. The ones that get away, my my favorite story, I'm very good friends with Anne Hathaway's mother. She and I did summer stock together. And her name is Kate McCauley when she isn't Kate Hathaway. And she told me this story, which I love. She, uh, she was up to play Evita in the tour and uh, she had six auditions, as you have for a role like that. And the last time she met with Hal Prince, uh, she left the theater and her agent contacted her. I don't, I guess she called the agent because there were no cell phones. And the agent said, yeah, Hal's office just called you, have the part, we're working on numbers. And then her next phone call was from her doctor who told her she was pregnant. And that was not the kind of role you could do pregnant. You just couldn't. So she didn't play Evita, but she had Anne Hathaway. So she'd have an Oscar in her <laughs> and, and more. Yeah, I so that I think that's a fair trade. Yeah. I think that's a yeah, fair trade. She well. does. She, she, she's perfectly happy with it. Oh, man. So. Well, Pat, do, can you leave us with anything? I, I'm so happy to have you on the show. Because oh, it was this great. You guys are great. Wonderful. Um, and and do you have any last minute advice or words for people who are, who are watching, who are, are looking at these things as, as possibilities? Well, constantly, I think, reinventing yourself. As I say, I started in vaudeville, really hard to imagine. Can you imagine what happened to the people who couldn't speak when silent movies went to sound? I mean, people who killed themselves because they couldn't adjust. I mean, influencers are so important in the business today or creating your own show like this one. Uh, you know, there's so many ways to be seen today that did not exist. My, my advice is don't, you know, follow your dream is always one of those things that feels too vague to me. Uh, I think, sure, we, we should follow our dream. But then what happens when the dream is more than anything else? Uh, I think you have to be able to decide what you can live with uh, in terms of pain, in, in terms of loss. I knew a young woman in, in L.A. who acting was everything to her. And, and she gave up several good relationships in order to keep doing what she was doing. She had a couple of series. But I, I never thought she was happy. Eventually, I, I met my wife in L.A. and We got married and we both had said, we started by saying, the business is going to have to come second or this isn't going to work. And, and it did. And we both worked enough. Did we become as big as we could have? No. But I think 
at 81, I, I've been, you know, in two brilliant marriages. My wife died at 51. It's a tragic loss, but I met my, my wife now, Amber, and she's chair of the department at ETSU of Communication. And uh, I met Rick McVeigh, and although I had two students on Broadway, Allison Gwynn, who was in Hair and in uh, two other shows uh, on Broadway, and uh, Adam Perry, who was in Frozen 2. And, you know, so I look not only, so I think you've got to decide to not be defined by what other people think. I guess if uh, my big thing is, is avoid the glance, as they say, you know, don't let other people's judgment of you, the worst stage Irishman in the history of Los Angeles theater. That's not how I define myself. And, and so if you love yourself and you must begin with that, if you don't love yourself, you can't love anyone. And it took me a long time as a drunk to not just want to obliterate myself, but to actually look in the mirror and say, you're, you're not a bad guy. You're not a bad guy. And if you can't start with that, you can't start with you're not a bad guy or gal, uh, then I don't think it matters what you do. Uh, I had a producer once in L.A. who actually was a good friend of Lenny Bruce, who was an idol of mine as a kid, you know, growing up. And he had Lenny pictures all over his office. And he was selling his soul every time he opened his mouth. And I said to him, how can you have pictures of you and Lenny Bruce on the wall and live the life you're living? And he was a guy who could have made or broken that career. But I, I never cared about that. I never cared about wanting something so bad that I would sell myself food. So I think deciding to love who you are, love the people around you. I love being with you guys tonight. It was great. And and we, we showed passion and fun. And we're willing to make fools of ourselves. Three of the best Julia Childs ever. And <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. But it is, you know, love yourself and love what you do and let the chips fall. Don't. Don't judge yourself like, I didn't get this or I didn't get that. You know, I'm a very happy 81-year-old. I really am. I, as Alex Trebek said, who died at 80, uh, he said, I have told my friends, he knew he was going, and he said, um, they can say a lot of things about me. The one thing they can't say, and I have told my friends this too, when I die, you cannot say, they took him too soon. <laughs> that isn't the case. So yeah. live the life so that, you know, you're pleased. Are you Are you pleased? The, the Dalai Lama says, live your life so that when you go back and relive it, it's just as good. There you go. It's just, it's just as good. So thank, thank you, you for sharing me tonight. Thanks. Yes, thank you it. so much. Yeah, this has been wonderful. What a wonderful start to season three for Coffee well, and Best Rose. of luck. And you'll love Rick. will be great. Oh, yes. Rick, Rick will have a lot of stories about me. Uh-oh. We're going to trade stories. Hey, and listen, I'll call you when we put together that Broadway show of Julia Childs. And then uh, yes. you know, we'll, yes. we'll, the three of us <laughs> I, will be ready. <laughs> I, I want to see her Scrapple recipe. Yes, yes. Please. That That's going in the script. It's going there. Yes. Thank you both very much. Thank, thank you for coming on. You bet. Right. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And thank you, Matt, for co-hosting on the season premiere, as always. Yep. So see you again. See you guys see you. later. See ya. Goodbye. Tune in right here for Caffeination and Articulation every Thursday or Friday or whenever we feel like hosting. And Matt's Where are you following?